بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافي مزيده وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين we intend learning and teaching, remembering and reminding, giving and receiving benefit and gain, encouraging adherence to Allah's book and the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inviting to guidance and leading to goodness, seeking therein Allah's countenance, pleasure, nearness and reward, transcendent and exalted is he. We intend what the author, our teachers and the pious have intended and what Allah knows of virtuous intentions and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. La ilaha illallah. So we're continuing in the Fiqh of Tahara and Metan Abi Shuja, we continued last week discussing purifying things from filth, or you could say removing filth. So we mentioned a number of categorizations. So what is meant by um, what is meant by imperceptible filth? Hukmiya, Najasa Hukmiya. That's when filth is um, it's been washed and there's none of the signs of it, taste or smell. And or color. Or color. And you know, dry. Mm. Mm. So Hukmiya, it, it's not a condition that it has been washed. It could merely, um, the, the taste, color, and smell could have merely vanished another way or not have actually been there in the first place. But basically, najasa hukmiya, or imperceptible filth, is filth uh, that doesn't have any perceptible qualities of taste, color, or smell. So it's just there, it's a ruling of impurity in that place, or on that object. However, it doesn't have perceptible attributes, um, though it still needs to be washed. Ya khair. Now, so then what about um, filth? that is difficult to remove. First of all, what does it mean uh, for filth to be difficult to remove? That after, after a normal attempt of uh, washing, that you still have, uh, you're still able to, to smell or to, to taste, but there's no other way you call it. So. so what does a normal attempt of washing mean? And does, is there any other additional one, detail? One or two, or a three, up to three wash with water. Three washings and with water. And elbow grease. <laughs> and what else? Uh, it's called it's make it Bob. It's, how do we know it's difficult? If, if the color and taste still after washing. After elbow grease, right? Yeah, three times. Three times, just with water. Or, or with the, with the, you said with the solution also we could do it with the solution. With a with a, a with an, a agent. with a cleaning agent. Right. So, a filth is deemed difficult to remove if it doesn't if color or odor does not is not removed by washing it three times with a cleaning agent like soap or like stain remover or like whatever is necessary to remove or, or bleach given the, the type of material, is washed three times with a cleaning agent and the appropriate type of friction for that um, material that you're, you're washing. If, if filth is not removed after three washings like that, then it is deemed difficult. And at that point, uh, color or odor um, may remain and it's still considered pure. However, both may not remain. And then above that is a level um, that is called impossibility, which essentially means it's so bad that the only way to remove it is if it were to be cut from the thing that's being purified. So like if it's on cloth, you'd have to cut it off, but otherwise it's not going to come off. And at that point, um, it's excused, however, it's not pure. Whereas at the level of difficulty, it's considered pure. So that's basically washing. Washing means water running over it. Um, it has to remove the object or the mass of, the, of, of, of whatever filth it is, as well as its qualities of taste, color, and smell. If it gets to the point of difficulty, meaning that um, washing it three times with a cleaning agent and uh, scrubbing or scratching or whatever, like appropriate friction, um, it still remains. 
then it's considered difficult. And if it is just odor or just color, then at the level of difficulty, um, it is considered pure, though both may not remain at the level of difficulty. At the level of a possibility, um, it may re both may remain. And um, impossibility means it's so bad that um, you have to cut it off to remove it. Now, um, qu your question? Okay. La ilaha illallah. So that's what we covered up to this point. And now he's going to mention types of filth which are excused. And we already discussed um, the urine of a, uh, an, a infant boy who's being nursed. We discussed that. And now we're going to discuss fil filth that is excused. And the author says, وَلَا يُعْفَى عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِنَ النَّجَاسَاتِ إِلَّا لِيَسِيرِ مِنَ الدَّمِ وَالْقَيْهِ وَمَا لَا نَفْسَ لَهُ سَائِلَ إِذَا وَقَعَ فِي الْإِنَاء وَمَاتَ فِيهِ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُنَجِّسُهُ So then he says, and the translation of the meaning of this is 1.9.1 in our translation, excusable filth. Filth is inexcusable except for, right? So typically, um, filth is inexcusable, meaning that it must be removed the article, the object must be purified from filth prior to prayer is what it means. It doesn't mean that it, it um, has to be purified necessarily another time. But for prayer, one must, as we will see, inshallah ta'ala, with a blessing in our lifespan and time, that your body, clothing, meaning all that you're carrying in the place of prayer, must be pure in order to pray. Otherwise, the prayer is invalid and... Um, Filth is, is unexcused, meaning that you must purify it prior to prayer with exceptions. And he's going to mention some of the exceptions that are excused, and we will also mention others. And also, um, some types of filth are excused in water, um, but not in prayer, meaning that they don't render water impure. And some types of filth are excused in prayer, um, meaning that they will still make water impure, but they're allowed to be on your body in prayer. And some types of filth are never excused, and some types of filth are excused in both water and prayer. So after mentioning some of these, we'll, we'll go over that categorization and uh, put some of these in those categories. Filth is inexcused except for small amounts of blood and pus. So now... This really is typically dealt with by the jurist in the discussion of conditions of prayer. Um, and in the prayer, on one's body or clothing, a small amount of blood or pus is excused, and a small amount means that which is um, typically deemed a small amount by common acknowledgement, by urf. And that's provided it not be mixed with something foreign, and then with, uh, with additional conditions, even a large amount of blood is excused. But that's, uh, that sh the, the proper context for that is in the discussion of purification for prayer. So inshallah ta'ala at that point we would revisit that. But blood and pus will be excused in prayer, though they're not excused in water. So like if a drop of blood falls in a small bucket of water, the water is rendered impure. Though if a drop of blood is on your clothing, a small drop, um, then... Uh, that you may pray in that with the condition that it's not mixed with something else. Two, living things which do not possess flowing blood, if they fall into a container and die therein, they do not render it filthy. So that's another thing that's excused. This is an example of something that's excused in water and not in prayer. The first is an example of something that's excused in prayer and not in water. So what does that mean? That means if a fly falls into your water container and dies, um, you can merely uh, take the fly out and the water is still pure with conditions that we'll mention. But you can't pray with a fly in your pocket, a dead fly. <laughs> Not that you want to, but if you find it you know, on your clothing after the prayer and you know it was there during the prayer, that means the prayer is invalid. It's excused in water and it's not excused in prayer. That's what we mean by that. So um, animals that are so small, like insects, for instance, that they don't have like, uh, what they call flowing blood. Um, and the example of this comes from the well-known tradition where the Prophet ﷺ dunked a fly that landed in, um, 
in a vessel uh, uh, that had a beverage in it, he dunked it um, deeper in, and that would, uh, was likely to kill it, which is an indication that um, if they fall in that and die, um, then they don't render it impure, and that it's excused. And basically the conditions for that is that someone didn't deliberately uh, put it in the water, and also that it didn't, the water doesn't change um, from this type of filth being in it. In, in that case, it's not excused. And then, those are two examples of excused things that he mentioned. However, there are many, many examples. And this um, discussion of what is excused is necessary because people, if they learn about Najasa and they don't learn the exceptions when it is excused, they'll become really ne neurotic about purification. And they can, like, I've, again, I've spent literally tens of hours helping people like this deconstruct the worlds of um, Najasa the bubbles of Najasa that they've constructed that they believe they live in. So um, it's necessary.